Good evening. Welcome to Behind Enemy Lines, featuring Mart Cohn, the true story of a French spy in Nazi Germany. As you can see, we have an amazing turnout tonight. Thank you all for coming out for this important event. Following Mart's story, there will be a question and answer session. If you are seated in the overflow areas, you are welcome to come in here to, to ask your question. Signed copies of Mart's book, Behind Enemy Lines, are being sold at the registration desk, although I do believe that they are selling rather quickly. I'd like to ask you at this point to turn your cell phones to silence. My name is Rabbi David Bush, and together with my wife, Devora, we run the Chabad Jewish Center here in Petaluma, catering to the Jewish community as well as a larger community to provide engaging and meaningful programs, celebrations, and special events for all ages. I'd like to extend a big thank you to the Santa Rosa Junior College for partnering with us to bring you this event. Catherine, Shirley, Matt, and the whole team, thank you so much. It's amazing to see so many people gathered here, not for the Super Bowl, though this promises to be way more interesting than that. <laughs> Not for a concert, but to hear the first-hand account from an incredible woman, a survivor, and a heroine. Mart's courage and bravery led to World War II being shortened. She received France's highest military honors, which you'll have a chance to see after her talk on the table over here. Her story, is one of espionage, intrigue, heroism, and perhaps most importantly, the power of the individual to absolutely change the course of the world. Tonight, we will hear about history. We will learn about the consequences of bigotry, hate, and anti-Semitism but we will also hear about the strength of the human spirit and its ability to survive against all odds. We will hear about how during the darkest days of the Holocaust, some tragically allowed their basest instincts to manifest. And at the very same time, some chose to courageously be their very best selves, expressing their divine spark within. Shortly after moving to Petaluma, we were driving in the car when my children noticed a mezuzah. A mezuzah is a scroll with a prayer written on it that is affixed to the doorposts of Jewish homes for blessing and for security. I made a mental note to stop by later and say hello. When I came back, I realized that there was no mezuzah. It was just a discoloration of the doorpost. Believing in divine providence, that there was a reason for me to be there at that time, I knocked anyways. 93-year-old Greta answered the door. After hearing that I was a rabbi, she told me that though she wasn't Jewish, she came from Denmark, and during the war, a Jewish doctor came to them and asked her mother if they would take in his daughter. Despite the immense inherent risk, of getting caught, they agreed, and they hid this Jewish girl named Sarah Kastensen. Days turned into months. Each night, under cover of darkness, Greta and her mother would bring a portion of food down to the basement, until one day they came down and she was gone. Years later, when the war was over, there was a knock on the door. Sarah had come back to thank them and explain how on that night the smugglers had come to take her across the border of Sweden. If we are ever doubtful, yes, one individual's act of courage, bravery, kindness, and compassion can make all the difference. One good deed can absolutely change the world. A woman who exemplified this trait heroically is Mart Kohn. 
She was born in France in 1920, yet is definitely one of the most youthful people that I have ever met. Full of life, vigor, vitality. May she be blessed with continued good health and happiness. We are so fortunate that Mart and her husband Major, who is here with us tonight, agreed to accept our invitation and travel from their home in Southern California to the snowiest place in Sonoma <laughs> County to share her incredible story and so that we can meet her in person. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Mart Cohn. First, I wish to thank Rabbi Bush and Mrs. Bush to have invited me tonight for that event. And I want to thank all of you who have come so numerous to listen to my journey during World War II. I am mostly honored that you prefer to listen to me than to the state of the union. <laughs> we will first show you a DVD. In 2004, Mr. Richard Frank the movie director of the Wiesenthal Center, the Museum of Tolerance, they have two names, in Los Angeles, where we live, came to my home and interviewed me for, four, for five hours. But be reassured, the DVD will last only 10 minutes. <laughs> Can we show the, oh, the DVD was made for a big bash in a hotel in Beverly Hills in 2004. And that DVD was not made by Mr. Richard Trank, but by somebody else in the visitor center. And after the movie, my comments will, uh, you will understand by my comments, why I say that. Here is the DVD. How does a young girl from a devoutly Orthodox Jewish family end up becoming a spy whose efforts helped to bring an earlier end to the war in Europe in 1945? The answer to that question was one that Martha Cohn, born Martha Hoffnung, kept to herself for the better part of a half century. Born in 1920, in the French town of Metz, in the Alsace region of France near the German border, Martha was one of seven children. The family was quite religious, but at the same time mixed easily with their non-Jewish neighbors. But with war clouds on the horizon in September of 1939, the Hoffnungs and many of their Jewish neighbors decided to move to a safer part of France, away from the German border, to the town of Poitiers, southwest of Paris. However, they were not safe for long. The Nazis invaded France, and with little resistance, the French government capitulated. Immediately, life began to change. We didn't know how bad it would be. We could not understand that, because even if you knew about Kristallnacht, that was in Germany, they did that to the Germans. They couldn't do that to the French people. For a while, in spite of the various restrictions placed on the Jews, the Hoffnungs were able to go about their daily business. Martha started nursing school and became engaged to a young medical student. As the war progressed, and resistance to the Nazis and their Vichy French collaborators became more widespread, the family began to take more chances. Martha and her sisters hid Jews who did not have the proper papers, and her fiancé became actively involved in resistance activities. One day, French police arrested her sister Stephanie and then her father. When her father was released shortly thereafter, 
the family managed to escape using false papers that did not identify them as Jews. There was a plan to help Stephanie escape from the French jail she was being held at, but sadly, it failed. She was caught into, into camp, and then later she was transferred to Drancy in, near Paris, and then to Pithiviers, and she wrote that they were going to be deported that afternoon, that afternoon of Yom Kippur 42. Most of the Hoffnung family went to the mountains to join an older brother who was head of the resistance there. Martha finished her nursing studies in Marseille, occasionally getting the chance to rendezvous with her fiance, Jean. Then, in the summer of 1943, she went to Paris to work for a month in a hospital, traveling again under her false papers. She met briefly with Jacques. He was on the run for a resistance act that led to the murder of a Nazi collaborator. She begged him to stay in hiding with her. And I told him, you cannot go back to Poitiers. You have immediately to escape and go south and go to Spain and I will join you. But he said, he has to go back to his family is in Poitiers, his brother is there. He, he will tell them goodbye and live with his brother as, and his friends as soon as they can. And he left after his examination, he left and he promised me to write me every day. And three letters arrived, and the fourth one never came. She soon learned that Jacques had been arrested along with his brother and several friends. He was tried and then executed for his resistance activities. Brokenhearted, Martha returned to Marseille, graduated from her nursing studies, and then moved back to Paris to work for a registry. She remained there until the Allies liberated France. When we heard on the radio that the troops were entering Paris, all the church bells started ringing, and we opened our windows and we all sang the Marseillaise. The whole city was singing the Marseillaise. Almost immediately after the liberation, Martha enlisted in the French army, where initially she worked as a social worker in the Alsace region of the country, close to her hometown of Metz. When her commanding officer learned that Martha spoke fluent German, he recruited her to join army intelligence. I was introduced to Colonel Bouvet. He told me he needs me to interrogate people, to know what's going on, to know, uh, to know how um, the strategy of the German, if they are retreating or not retreating, and how many people are there, you know, all these military information. After procuring information from Nazi POWs, Martha was ready for her spy mission. It involved crossing the border from Switzerland into Germany to see how entrenched the Nazis still were. She would then have to pass that intelligence on to the Allies. It took more than 13 tries, but Martha made it over the border into Germany. Her cover was that she was a German nurse trying to find out what happened to her Nazi fiancé. One day, she came upon a group of German soldiers who had retreated from the Allies. And we were walking, and among us was a non-commissioned officer who was an SS, and he was raving about the Jews, how much he had killed Poles and Jews and all that. And he loved, uh, and he smelled Jews a mile away. You know, that's always what they say. He was going back to the Siegfried line. He had been wounded, and he came back from the hospital. And as we walked, he fainted. So I was a good German nurse. I took care of him. From this SS soldier, Martha was able to obtain important information about exactly what was going on at the Nazi front lines, making her way back to the Swiss border, she was able to transmit her report with the help of a Swiss farming family. Martha then crossed the border again and made her way back into Germany to see if there was anything else she could uncover. I walked to the Siegfried line to see what's going on. And when I arrived at the Siegfried line, they were all gone. The, the last stragglers were leaving. And they told me that the Siegfried line is empty. Do you realize what? an important information that was. 
The information Martha uncovered helped to shorten the Allied effort to defeat the Nazis and saved untold numbers of lives. For the better part of a half century, Martha did not talk of her experiences, even with her family. But in the mid-1990s, while visiting in France, she made a request for her French army records. When officials at the French archives saw her file of commendations and achievements, the wheels were put into motion for her to be awarded the Médaille Militaire, one of France's highest military honors, and the same medal awarded to Sir Winston Churchill by the French government. Why was she so quiet about her exploits over the years? It was not modesty, but I thought that nobody would believe me. You know, usually a spy is a very tall, all good-looking woman, and I didn't feel I was that type of a person at all. I was a very unlikely spy. <laughs> I have some comments to make about that defeat. Every time I meet the media, and if some media is attending tonight, I do not intend to offend anybody. But Every time I am interviewed, the media never renders things the way I tell them. <laughs> and that has nothing to do with fake news. <laughs> so... The first error. The first error in the DVD is they pretend I was born in Alsace. Alsace-Lorraine are two provinces, and they are always cited together because their historical fate was similar. But in reality, they are two different provinces. One of the main things, the Alsatians speak a German dialect, which is called Alsatian. But in the department of the Moselle, which was annexed with Alsace during, from 1970, from 1870, by Kaiser Wilhelm, Kaiser Wilhelm I first and his Bismarck, General Bismarck, who invaded France. The army stopped at the doors of Paris. They did not enter Paris like in 1940, but they assieged Paris, and the Parisians were starving. So the French government wanted the Prussians to go back to Prussia. But Kaiser Wilhelm I and Bismarck demanded that the French government give them all of Alsace and the department of the Moselle, of which my hometown of Metz is the capital. A the French government accepted and gave them Alsace and the department of the Moselle, which, were, which is in Lorraine. And the German uh, as annexed Alsace and the department of the Moselle. And it was forbidden to speak French in this in Alsace and the department of the Moselle, which were annexed by the Prussian army. So my parents, the, when I was born in 1920, less than a year and a half after World War I, had the, and I was number five, I, had not yet the time to learn French, but they spoke a real Hochdeutsch, a very good German. And I learned German from them, which explains why I was able to do that work later in Germany. Uh, the 
that's a second error. That's a second error, which is much more important, is that my sister Stephanie was never arrested by the French police. That's absolutely not true. In my book, I wrote that she was arrested. that she was arrested by the Gestapo. The Gestapo was a police unit, the best known, which served the German government and the German army. And when they come to your house to arrest somebody, they don't tell you to what police units they belong. So we thought it was the Gestapo. But years later, I did some research for Yad Vashem, the, the museum in Jerusalem, and I found out that my sister was arrested by the Zippo, S-I-P-O, which are just initials of a very long German war. If you know German, that you would know that the German love to take one word, add a word, add a word, add a word, and make a very long word. <laughs> and that the Zippo is that way. And the Zippo was created by a decree signed by Hitler in March 1942. My sister was arrested June 17, 1942, in Poitiers, which where we were refugees, like you heard in the DVD, because certain things in the DVD are right. So my sister was arrested by the Zippo and taken to the office to be interrogated. She refused to give any information because any information she would have given was the denunciation from a, of a farmer, Mr. Noel de Gou, to whom she and I, we sent hundreds of people. We saved their life. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know from where they came, but they rang our bell to ask for help. And the help <coughs> consisted of crossing from occupied France to non-occupied France. France, the German army occupied three quarters of France. And one quarter was under the government of Marechal Pétain was very much loved by the French at that time because he had been victorious in Verdun during World War I, like you are happy with Eisenhower. So the French loved Pétain. But Pétain, during that chaotic time when the Germans had invaded France, Took the, took the government over without being elected. We were a democracy, but it was never elected. It just took over because of the chaotic events. So, and Pétain promised the French that he would be the guardians against the German army and the German government. But in reality, he, col he collaborated 100% with the German. And after the war, Marechal Pétain was very old, was condemned to, prison, to death, but General de Gaulle change the death sentence, death condemnation to prison. And Marechal Pétain died in prison. He was never released. 
because he was a traitor to France. To give you an idea of what was going on in France historically. So, Noël de Gaulle had property. Mr. de Gaulle, it's Noël de Gaulle, the farmer to whom we sent all these people who rang our bell, had a farm in Dieny, a little, uh, about an hour by car from Poitiers. But in 1942, the French had no more cars and no more gasoline because the Germans who were occupying us were stealing everything we had. So the people who wanted to go to Dieny had to walk or take a bus. And Mr. de Groo had a farm which was partially in occupied France and partially in non-occupied France. What, so once on his property, it was very easy to go from one sector to the other. And Mr. de Gou was extremely clever and he was able to save thousands of people, among them American and English pilots who had been shot down over occupied France and needed to get out of occupied France as fast as possible because they didn't speak a word of French. And they would have been noticed immediately by the German army, arrested and God knows what would have happened to them. And French prisoners of war who had escaped from prison, from the camps, and would have been immediately sent back to Stalag in Germany and severely been punished for having escaped. And all the barriers that the Germans did not tolerate, like the Jews, the communists, and whoever, the Germans couldn't tolerate. So, they had no proof. So the, the Germans had no proof, had suspicions that Mr. De, de Gaulle was helping people cross into non occupied France on his property. But they had no evidence because I told you that Mr. De Gaulle was extremely clever and knew how to proceed. But my sister made a huge error. She said to Mr. de Groo, because there was no personal communication between occupied and non-occupied friends at that time. So she sent a letter to Mr. de Groo to send him the tobacco voucher, a young man we had sent to Mr. de Gou and had successfully crossed into not occupied France had forgotten in our house. If you had a tobacco voucher, if you smoked, you needed it to buy tobacco or cigarettes. If you didn't smoke, you backed at it against food because food was already scarce all over France. So that letter, my sister made the huge mistake of signing her real name, which we never did. Why she did it, we don't know, because it was no use to discuss the issue with her. It was too late. But the Zippo was having suspicion about Mr. de Gou intercepting that letter and came to the house and arrested my sister. As I told you, she was taken to the offices of the Zippo and questioned, and she refused to give any information because any information she would have given was a denunciation of Mr. de Gaulle. So two hours later, the Zippo came back to the house and arrested my father 
to put pressure on my sister to give them the information. But even in the presence of my father, being afraid that he would be kept, my sister refused to give any information. And Mr. de Gaulle was never deported. He died peacefully in his bed several years after the war. And he was awarded by Yad Vashem, the museum in Israel, the title of just among the nation, the title of just yes, the just among the nations. And your sister now. My sister was in prison for one month in Pachi. And she celebrated her 21st birthday on July 10th, 1942, in prison. And when, and she was, after that month of prison, she was transferred to, the, to a camp on the fringes of the city of Poitiers. The camp was called Le Camp de la of the route of Limoges. Limoges is a city south of Poitiers. And you can find that camp on Google and check what it was like. And, in, the, in the prison, you couldn't see her. Yeah, in prison, we could not visit her. But in the camp, we, one person of the family could go once a month. And my sister, who was a medical student, started to give medical care to the children in the camp. They had received no medical care until then. In that camp, there were foreign Jews only and Chicans in an adjoining camp. But the foreign Jews were there with entire families, even newborns, and they had received no medical care whatsoever. My sister, who was a medical student, started to give medical care to the children in the camp. And when we, the family, organized that she escapes from the camp. We had found two French guardians who accepted to help her escape. She refused because she felt that what she was doing was too important for the children. So in prison, we could not visit her, but in the camp, one person of the family could visit her once a week. One week, I went to see her, and I reminded her that her mother needed her as much as the children. And she answered me, don't you realize that if I escape, you are all going to be arrested? I had never thought about that. On my way back home, I had a very long walk. I decided that all the members of my family who were still in Poitiers, we would escape into non-occupied friends so she can escape too. And we were successful. I have not the time to tell you the details of how we crossed that border between occupied and non-occupied friends. We couldn't do it at Mr. Mr. Noel de Gouth's place because he was under constant surveillance by the SIPO. So we did it somewhere else, and we were successful. It's one of the most beautiful human story that you can read about during the war. So 
we escaped, but my sister never escaped. And after we escaped, she was transferred to the to the camps of Drancy near Paris, which was an atrocious camp, and then later PTV, which was not much better, and from the, where she was departed on September 21, 1942, the day of Yom Kippur, which is the highest Jewish holiday of the year, like Christmas for the Christians. On that day, she was departed on an unknown destination. In her last letter, like I told you before, she could not write to us. We were now in non-occupied France, and there was still no postal communication between the two sectors. So she wrote to a friend in Poitiers, and in the postscriptum she added, at the last rumors, we are leaving for friend, uh, for, we are leaving for Mets to work. So no need to dramatize. And these are the last words she ever wrote, because years, years later, we found out that she had been sent to Auschwitz and she never came back. So I like to honor my sister before I tell my own story. But before I go to my own story, I have another subject. I will elaborate upon as briefly as I can. 75% of Jews in France survived. There is only one other country in Europe where more Jews survived, and that was Denmark. But in Denmark, the Danish fish fishermen took at the risk of their life and of every member of their family, they took the Danish Jews to, to Sweden, which was a neutral country. And that's how they saved 95% of Danish Jews by taking them to neutral Sweden. Had they kept them in Denmark, which is a very small and flat country. They could not have eaten 95% of the Jews. They were about 700 and some Danish Jews in 7,200 Danish Jews in Denmark. So in France, it was different. We had huge mountains all over France. We had rural, a lot of rural places where thousands and thousands of Jews were hidden, children and adults. And all these people in some rural towns and villages, every family had Jews hidden. And they all risk their life and that of every member of their family to do that. But they did it. And all these people who are hidden in these rural places survived the war. And that's why 75% of Jews in France survived. And my family was enormously helped during the whole war. If not, we wouldn't be alive at the end of the war. And I give you an example. Several weeks after, uh, before my sister was arrested, I met in the main street of Poitiers, in Rue Gambetta, Mr. Chacoutier, with whom I had worked in the French city hall, of which I was thrown out one day by three military, German military 
policemen. They were huge guys. They had to be at least six foot to be in the German military police. They looked like football players. <laughs> and they came in our office armed with rifles and bayonets, screaming, Judenraus, which means Jews out. And that's how, in a half of an hour, I lost my job at the French City Hall in Poitiers. Okay, go back to Monsieur Charpentier. Yeah, so Mr. Charpentier, when he told me that he could provide me with identity cards without the stem Jew, I told him, Mr. Charpentier, you cannot do that. You risk your life and that of your wife and little boy. I had seen pictures when we worked together. And he answered me, if I didn't help you, if I didn't save at least your family, I could not live without myself. And I asked him how much it would cost to provide. We were eight people still in Poitiers, counting my sister Stephanie, because at that time I still thought that she could escape from the camp. And he answered, he started crying. I was 21 years old. I had never made a man cry yet. So I was very embarrassed. And he told me, I do not want any money. I do that because I want to save you. And he provided me with his identity cards for every member of my family without a damn Jew. And I hid these cards without telling my parents even, because I knew already that less people knew what was going on than safer it was. So when I was walking from the camp to the house and I decided we were going to, to escape, I knew we could do it because I had this identity cards without the stem Jew. With the stem Jew, you couldn't go to any public space. You couldn't go to a train station, you couldn't go to a post office, you couldn't go to a public park, you couldn't go swimming, you couldn't go to a movie, and you couldn't have a telephone. Imagine children, what it is to be without a telephone. And we couldn't have a radio either. Couldn't go shopping. And we couldn't go shopping until 4.30 for food, until 4.30 in the afternoon. And we had a window of one hour to do all our shopping. You have to remember that at that time, there were no supermarkets. There were only mom and pop shops, and every shop sold only one item. So you had to go from shop to shop to shop to buy all your food. But all owners of these shops told us, do not worry, we know that you have to buy, you have only one hour. So, and we know exactly what you are used to buy in our store. So come at 430, we will put things aside for you. And then you will have time to go to the other shops. And as long as we lived in Poitiers, we were never deprived of anything. So now I will go back to my story. To my story. I, after the liberation of Paris, you no, no. saw. You, you, you went to get to finish your nursing. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> my husband is my prompter. 
and he puts me back on track when I'm off track. <laughs> so, I w we were now in unoccupied France, and I wanted to finish my studies of nursing I had started in Poitiers, one year in Poitiers, and I needed another year. But another school in another city in non-occupied France had already refused me because I was Jewish. So in Marseille, where I was, I, you have to read my book to know the details. I have no time to go into all the details. We would be here until tomorrow. So I wanted to finish. And I had heard that Mrs. Keller, the regional director of the French Red Cross in Marseille, was a very nice person. So I went to see her. And I told her, I'm Jewish, and I need to finish my studies of nursing. I started in Poitiers, and I showed her my documents, and I would like to go to a school here in Marseille to finish my studies. And she took my hand and said, I don't see why it would be impossible to do that. And she called the French Red Cross School in Marseille and told the director on the phone in front of me, I have here a young French woman who did a year in, Mar in Poitiers. She would like to finish her studies in your school. I want you to accept her and not make her life miserable. <laughs> So I went to the school where the directrice of the school and her deputy were sitting with very long faces and they told me immediately, we do not want any Jews in our school and make sure you don't go back to Mrs. Keller. I left without answering anything and sure enough, I went back to Mrs. Keller. <laughs> and Mrs. Keller told me immediately, she was hor horrified. She took the phone and she called them and told them, Miss Hoffnung is back here and I want to tell you, I am going to send her back. And if you don't accept her and don't make her life miserable, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> and I went back, and they had to accept me. But they made my life very miserable <laughs> for quite a while. And after that, things, with time, things got better. And I graduated in the fall of 1943 with my degree of as a registered nurse. And I decided to go back to Paris. I could do that because I had the identity card of me, from Mr. Charpentier without the term Jew. I took a train to Paris, and in Paris I worked for an agency. I did not work for a hospital. They would have asked me too many questions. The agency asked no questions, and I was able to make a living which was forbidden to Jews. And at that time, thousands and thousands of Jews and other barriers that the Germans could not tolerate and had no savings because they had no right to work, starved to death. And I was able to make a living, and I survived. And my sister made a living too, and she survived. And after the liberation, 
I decided I wanted to join the French army. I made, I had made that decision much before, but there I wanted to accomplish it. And it was extremely difficult because thousands of people want to join the French army. And I stayed in line for several days. And once I re finally reached a person, and that was a woman, I, she asked me immediately to show her my identity card. I presented that Mr. Charpentier had forms for me. She looked at it and she immediately told me that that card is a forged card. <laughs> the army cannot accept it. She must have been in the resistance or underground, whatever you call it, in forged papers because nobody had ever questioned the validity of my card uh, until then. So she asked me to, for my birth certificate, Paris was liberated in August 1944. But Metz, my hometown, was liberated only in November 1944. So I could not provide my birth certificate. The Germans would never have sent it, you can be sure. So, and third point, like everybody who wanted to join the French army at that point in Paris, had, or in any part of France, Liber already liberated, had to prove that they had not collaborated with the German army. How do you prove something you haven't done? That's <laughs> impossible. So I couldn't do it. So I joined only the army several months later, after Poitiers was liberated, later than Paris. I took the first train which functioned between Paris and Poitiers. And I went to visit the mother of my fiancé you saw in the DVD. She was all alone at home. Her two sons, my fiancé Marc, who was a medical student, and his younger brother Marc, who was a law student, and two of their friends had been all, all for executed by shooting by the German army on October 6, 1943, in, on Mont Valeria, the worst prison in Paris. And her husband, who was a resident too, had been arrested at the same time as his children. And he was now in the concentration camp, camp of Buchenwald in Bavaria. So she, Madame Delaunay was home all alone and she was very ill. I took her to Paris to live with my sister and me and we provided her the medical care she needed so badly. And after she was better, I took her to the cemetery where her two sons had been buried by the German, Germans. It was, the cemetery was in Ivry, I-V-R-Y, a suburb of Paris. And there was a huge section with all the, the tombs of those who had been executed by the Germans. And that these tombs had no names, no numbers, nothing. They were absolutely anonymous. But the first time I came to that cemetery, the French manager told me 
how I could find the tombs. And he warned me to be extremely careful because the Gestapo, he didn't know about the Zippo. The Gestapo was watching the seven, that section of the cemetery. But now we were after the liberation of Paris. So I took the mother of my fiancé to the cemetery one day because General de Gaulle was supposed to come and talk to the parents or to the families of the executor. General de Gaulle arrived with a huge uh, retenue. And he, uh, he saluted and left. General de Gaulle was a very good general, but certainly he was not very good. <laughs> so, he refused to talk to people. And but he was very clever. And Mrs. De Gaulle, uh, Mrs. Delaunay talked with the chiefs of the resistance and the chiefs of the army who were the entourage of De Gaulle and stayed and talked to the people. And they asked her, what they could do to help her. I was standing next to her, and she told them, Miss Hoffnung, the fiancé of my oldest son, would like to join the army, but she has not the right documents. Can you help her? In a few days, everything was done. I was now assigned to the 151 Regiment of Infantry was in Alsace. If you remember, that's where I was not born. <laughs> and I was told to go to a certain place in Paris where I would find a bus to take me to the front. I went, I found the bus, and we left. I was the only woman on board. All the others were officers, non-commissioned officers and soldiers who had come on furlough to Paris and were returning to the front. And I was the only newcomer. So we had a very long ride because the bus needed repairs constantly and we had no gasoline. Before 1939, France was a very rich country. But in 1944, after the Germans occupied France almost five years and stole everything we had, we were completely bankrupted. So our first French army, which was in Alsace, with the third and sixth American army, was quasi independent strategically, but needed all her resources came from the third and sixth American army. That was an agreement between the French army and the American army in Alsace. But between Paris and Alsace, the Americans had no ideas of that agreement. So when two of our officers went to the American officers, and they always took me along because they thought it would help. It didn't help at all. <laughs> they, the Americans looked at us and said, the French army no way are we going to help you. So we had one option. Our two officers were stealing the jerry cans of jeeps stopped along the road. And I was a lookout <laughs> because I was the only girl. So I was an accomplice. And that's how we made it to the front. And when we arrived at the front, 
I was immediately debriefed. That means interviewed by an officer of intelligence of the regiment to which I was assigned. In every regiment of every army of the world, there is at least one officer of intelligence. And he asked me immediately what I had done during the resistance. And I told him that during the resistance, I had worked with my sister who was deported and of whom we had still no news. And we had saved hundreds of people. And sending them, sending them to, sending them to Noel de Gou. I told him the whole story. And then after my sister was deported, I did some resistance on my own. But I was never accepted by a group of resistance. And I explained to him that several times I was interviewed, interviewed by chiefs of the resistance in the attics of big buildings in Marseille and Paris because it was ultra secret. And every time the chiefs of the resistance looked at me, I, as you have seen, I am not very tall, and that's an understatement. But I was taller than I am now, because I shrunk like all old people. I was 4'11". I was very thin. I was very blonde, with blue eyes and a light skin. And the chiefs of the resistance considered me completely as a non-substance, they felt that I was a bimbo, and they refused me. And I told that to the captain, and he said to me, that's a lot of balloons. <laughs> Rabbi, I'm sorry to use such a word. <laughs> you should have gone out of it. So the captain said to me, you should have gone out and killed a German in the street. And I answered, I am a nurse. I take care of people. I don't kill anybody, not even the Germans I hate. So he said, you see, you are not fit to be in the army. And he too wanted to send me back to my mother. I told him, no, I had enough trouble coming. So headquarters in Paris sent me. I am going to stay. So furious, he told me, as a registered nurse, you should be an officer. But because you were such a coward during the resistance, I make you sergeant. And I just shrugged my shoulders because I couldn't care less what grade he was giving me. So more furious, he told me, I do not need nurses. I have enough nurses. You are going to be a social worker. All my training had been in nursing. I had not the smallest concept of what social work entailed. But in the army, and that counts for all armies in the world, if they tell you you're a social worker, that's what you are. <laughs> So I, I left his office and went to the town where all the troops who were not on the front had a room in the town. I slept all night, and the next morning I got up and put on the American uniform I was given. I told you all our resources came from the third and sixth American armies. And that uniform was much too big for me, but it was warm. And that was very important because the winter of 1944, 1945 was unusually cold. 
And once in uniform, I wonder what I should do because I was not given any orders or any expectation of what was expected from me as a social worker. So I decided to visit our troops at the front. I inquired, I left the town in a certain direction and crossed a small forest. On the other side of the forest was a canal. There are lots of canals in Alsace. And our troops were on the western edge of the canal. The Germans had retreated several days earlier on the eastern edge of the canal. I entered the fox holes of our troops. They were very surprised because they had never seen a social worker in their fox holes. <laughs> I asked them what they needed and they requested mainly underwear, socks, hats, scarves, blankets, food, reading and writing material. I would go back to the town and the Alsatians were extremely generous and gave me a lot of things for our troops. And that I did for three weeks. And one day, crossing the square of the village, of the town, I met the colonel of the regiment in 1943. We all knew that the resident had killed the first German in France. And it was in the metro station Barbès Rochechouart in Paris. And the, we knew too that the resistant had escaped. But we didn't know his name because that was ultra secret. Now, when I joined that regiment, I very quickly learned that the colonel of the regiment was a resistant who had killed the first German in Paris in Metro Station by uh, Barbès Rochechouart. There is now a station in Paris bearing his name, which is Pierre Fabien. So Pierre Fabien stopped me and asked me to come with his, to his office where I would answer his phone during his lunch break. I went with him to his office. He showed me around and leaving. He was very good looking, which doesn't hurt anything. <laughs> and he was very courteous. And he said to me, I am sorry. I have nothing to read for you. There are only German books here. And I answered him, I, I, it's quite all right. I read German fluently. So extremely interested. He asked me if I spoke German. And I told him yes, as well as French. And he explained to me that in the German army, all males from the age of 12 to old age were all in uniform in the army. So any man in civilian clothes walking the streets of Germany would be noticed and arrested. That's why they needed women to do that type of work. And he asked me, if I accepted to be transferred to the intelligence service of the first French army to which we belong. And I accepted. He left. I sat on a chair and wondered in what predicament I had put myself. <laughs> but it was too late. Two days later, two officers came and picked me up and took me to Mulhouse, a city, another city in Alsace. 
and later we went to Kalmar, another city in Alsace, where I underwent an extremely intensive training for what I was going to do. And when the training was finished, I was asked to create my own alibi, which would stick much better than an alibi given to me. So I created my alibi, presented it, it was accepted. After that, I was assigned to the commandos of Africa. In the DVD, you heard speak about Colonel Bouvet. He commanded the, com the commandos of Africa. All the regiments of the first French army came from Af North Africa, from Algeria, where they were formed. To, they were all the army of General de Gaulle, in contrast to the army of Maréchal Pétain, who was not the Free French Army, but that was the Free French Army. So... Yes, he asked you first to interrogate. Yeah, so Colonel Bouvet asked me first to interrogate prisoners of war to learn the, the plan of retreat of the Germans from Alsace to Germany. In winter of 1944, the Germans had counterattacked in Belgium, and that counterattack was so powerful that they almost won the war. But luckily, the Allied armies stopped that counterattack just before Christmas of 1944. Now, we were in January 1945. The Germans were again counterattacking, coming through Strasbourg, the capital of Alsace. And that counterattack was so powerful again that all the Allied armies had to retreat west into France for quite a while until the counterattack was stopped. It took several weeks, and I was amongst those who had to retreat west. So Colonel Bouvet explained to me that the Germans were now counterattacking because that was their last, last chance to prevent the Allied armies to invade, the growth of the Allied armies to invade Germany by crossing the Rhine. So I interrogated generals and colonels. Subaltern would have known anything about the plan of retreat. And I can, I can boast that I obtained important information because in the citation of one of my medals on the table, the Croix de Guerre, it's written that I obtained extremely important information from these officers, too, from the generals and colonels. <coughs> and I provided Colonel Bouvet with extremely important information about the plan of retreat of the German from Alsace to Germany. That was my first achievement in the army. After that, Colonel Bouvet asked me to cross the front. the front in Alsace, not yet in Germany, the front in Alsace. And 13 times I tried to cross the front in Alsace, and 13 times I was not successful. There are many reasons for that. One of the reasons during the war Things are very fluid and change very fast. 
and I was told to go to a certain place where I would find specific things. But when I arrived in that place, I could not find anything, so I could not proceed. That happened several times during the 13 attempts to cross the front. There were other reasons. We had military guides who knew the region extremely well and explained to me exactly what I would find on the ground between A and B and how to proceed on the ground. But these military guides are humans and they make mistakes. And twice the military guide made a huge mistake. I will give you an example. One night very late, I was always taken very late. Around midnight, I was taken by ship to a certain place on a route in Alsace. The jeep stopped and the two officers and I, we got out and they explained to me that I should cross that huge field covered with snow in front of us and find the town northwest of that field where I will meet a group of German soldiers who were going to retreat still in Alsace, not yet in Germany, but still in Alsace, to mix with them, follow them, and send back as in much information I could. I was in civilian clothes, as you can imagine, not in uniform, and I had a small suitcase with a change of clothes I had taken all the labels of, of all my clothes so nobody could tell they come from France. But I had no card, no map. I had no radio. You have to be two to have a radio. I had no arms. I had no, no uh, compass. I had not even a flashlight, and I had nothing in writing. Everything I needed to know was in my memory. So I left and I started crossing that huge field covered with snow. I had not even a land, uh, flashlight. And it was a very, very dark and cold, cold night of February 1944. And as I crossed that field, going, I hoped, northwest, I had no compass, but I tried to go northwest. I suddenly heard a huge crack, and I felt myself completely submerged in the ice cold water of a canal. The military guide had forgotten to tell me there was a canal in that field. I told you they are humans. And I popped up and started, tried to grasp the edge of the, field, of the canal. But everything was so frozen that I couldn't grasp sufficiently and now I was much heavier because I was drenched from head to toe with that ice cold water. So it took me a very long time to find a place where I was able to grasp sufficiently to get out. Several times I wondered if I should just let go. But my instinct of surviving was much too strong. And I made it. I got out of the canal. If not, I wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> and I walked all night looking for that town. And I never found it. And at daybreak, I saw the prints of my shoes showed that I had walked all night in circle. And 
much later, years, years later, I read in a magazine that if you have no compass and no other mark to direct you, by a very dark night, you are going to walk in circles if you have no, no way of finding your way. And that explained why I had done that very weird thing I had never understood. <laughs> but after that, the captain who directed our small group of intelligence decided that I was going into Germany by crossing from Switzerland. Now, Switzerland was neutral. But the Swiss had helped the Germans as long as the Germans were successful. Now, we were successful. They were helping us. That's neutrality. <laughs> so I was taken by one of our officers to Basel, a Swiss town, where I met again. I had met him before. Colonel Reinhardt, it's a fictitious name, who was the director of the Swiss intelligence of the customs in Basel. And Colonel Reinhardt accepted that I crossed from Switzerland into Germany. He called an agent, Mr. Le Maire, another fictitious name, to take me to the border. Mr. Le Maire took me by car to Schaffhaus, which is another city in Switzerland. And, but Schaffhaus is very close to the city of Zingen, the first city in Germany where I was supposed to, to go. So Mr. Le Maire stopped the car near a forest. We crossed the forest by foot, and on the other side, he showed me a huge field. There are lots of fields in my story. <laughs> but that field was bordered on the northern edge by a small country road. So the forest and the field were Switzerland. But the country road was Germany, and there was no barrier along the width of that field. That was the only place where there was no barrier whatsoever. You could walk from the field onto the road. But the road was under the surveillance of two German military sentinels heavily armed, which came, one, from the eastern edge of the width of the field, walked on the road about the center, to the center of the width of the field, and stopped. The other sentinel came from the west, met him. They talked two, three seconds, turned their back, and walked back to the edge of the field. And they were doing that constantly for 24 hours, night and day. And Mr. Le Maire explained to me that towards evening, when both sentinels had just separated and both turned their back to me, I crawl along the field and hide behind the bushes near the road, and when the two sentinels come back and separate again, turning the back to me, I walk on the road and walk to the sentinel which, who comes back from the eastern edge, because Singen was to the east, to the right. Very well. Mr. Le Maire and I, we stayed in that little forest all afternoon. And Mr. Le Maire was a middle-aged man. I was 24 years old. He talked to me about his wife and children and a lot of other things. But in the afternoon, 
with a very strange smile, he said to me, You probably will be killed tonight. Why don't we have good ti a good time now? <laughs> but that was not on my agenda. So we talked about other things and to us, but it was still light. He told me, now is a moment. I took my little suitcase. In my little suitcase, I had, like before, taken all the labels of my clothes so nobody could tell they come from friends. And I had no compass, no arm, no map, no radio, nothing written. Everything I needed to know was in my memory. But I had now two new things. The day before we left, I was given vouchers, vouchers by my, my intelligence service. I was given vouchers for everything I would need in Germany, for trains, for buses, for, for uh, hotels, restaurants, food, for whatever I need to buy in Germany, because everything in Germany was on vouchers. But nobody in my service was able to tell me how to proceed with these vouchers. You cannot just go to an office and present a voucher. You have to know what to do with it. But nobody could tell me what to do. And that was given to me, like I told you, one day before I left. And you also had German money. I had too, a lot of German money that I needed to buy what, for whatever I need to buy in Germany. So. When Mr. Le Maire told me, now is the moment, I took my little suitcase and left and crawled along the field and hid behind the bushes. Until then, everything was perfect. But once behind the bushes, I suddenly realized the immensity of what I was going to real to to do in Germany. And two, I suddenly realized how dangerous it was to have these vouchers that I didn't know how to proceed with. And I remember too that I had forgotten and my handlers had to ask and my handlers had forgotten to tell me the name of the clinic where I was supposed to work as a nurse in Constance. And suddenly, I became so terrified that I was completely paralyzed by fear. And it took me a very, very long time to overcome that fear. But something clicked in my brain and made me get up, take my little suitcase and walk on the street, and walk on the street towards the German sentinel who was coming back from the eastern edge of the field. I raised my right arm, Heil Hitler, and he asked to see my identity card. I was now called Martha Ulrich, and I told you before I had a huge alibi. And the soldier looked at my card, and I wondered if he too would dis discover that that card was forged by my intelligence service. But he gave it back to me Without questioning, I was now in Germany. Rabbi, and all the audience, I have to ask you, are you willing to listen 
15 minutes more of my talk that I can finish it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you have seen in the DVD that I was in Freiburg. My sector was from Freiburg to the Swiss border, which is an enormous sector. You have to Google it and you will see how huge it is. And I, I was, as I didn't know what was going on in Germany, because I was sent to Germany for two purposes, for military intelligence, of course, but also intelligence how the civilian were reacting to the war and behaving, which was very important for the Allied armies which were going to invade Germany very soon. So I was w watching to see what the Germans were doing. I didn't know much about what they were doing. And I noticed that transportation was completely stopped during the day because of the bombardment of the American and English Air Force. And, but this transportation functioned only at night, never in daytime. So in daytime, if the Germans were in no military car, functioned either in daytime because of these bombardments. So in daytime, if the Germans wanted to go someplace, they walked. And they always walked in groups because the Germans are not very in independent. <laughs> and that's their nature. And uh, you joined a group. I joined the group. And in that group was that SS they talked about in the DVD. And that SS told us immediately that he had been wounded on the Russian front and he came back from an hospital and he was now assigned to the Siegfried line, of which an entrance was on the way on, to, to where we were going. And as we walked, I walked next to him and he told us that that he smells a Jew a mile away. But that morning, his smell was not very good. <laughs> so as we walked, he told us constantly, he didn't stop speaking. He told us of the atrocities the SS and the Wehrmacht had committed on the Russian front. They were atrocities on the Western Front in France too. But it was nothing, nothing compared to what was happening on the Eastern Front. If you don't know anything about it, you have to read about it. It was absolutely atrocious. And all the Germans around him were pushing him to give them more details. They loved to hear them. And they were slapping their thighs and saying, Armensch, which is like, oh boy, in English. And I was walking next to him and I was smiling because if I hadn't smiled, I would have been arrested. That's all I could achieve, it's mine. And suddenly, the German, we were walking at a good pace, he suddenly fainted. So I took care of him. And when he regained consciousness, he was so grateful that I had taken care of him that he invited me to visit him at the Siegfried line and he gave me his phone number. For three weeks, I didn't go. I had other things to do. 
But three weeks later, I came back to Freiburg, and I heard on the German radio that the, that the Allied armies were very close and were going to invade Freiburg. Then I decided to go to see my friend, the SS, to see what was going on at the Siegfried Line. And when I arrived there, I walked all alone that day. 10 kilometers, if you know how to change 13 miles. And I walked an enormous amount in Germany. And when I arrived at the Siegfried Line, I discovered that the Siegfried Line had been completely evacuated. The last stragglers were leaving. And they told me, they are all gone. We are the last one to leave. So I asked several stragglers who worked independently, because in intelligence, you have to have at least three positive uh, assessment to make sure that the information is confirmed. And once I felt it was confirmed, I walked back to Freiburg as fast as I could, because I understood immediately that if the Allied armies had not to fight the Siegfried Line, which was an atrocious project, we could much quicker invade the south of Germany and terminate the war. So I walked as fast as I could and reached Freiburg, where all the people from Freiburg were running to their houses because they all had heard on the German radio that Freiburg was going to be invaded by foreign armies. I was in Poitiers when the German army invaded. And I can tell you, it's extremely frightening to be invaded by a foreign army. So I was all alone in the center of Freiburg. I, I went back to the, main to the main street of its main boulevard of, Poitiers, uh, of Freiburg. And I waited. And the first tank arrived and drove towards me. How was I going to tell the people on the tank that I was a friend and not an enemy? I had no documents, nothing to prove who I was. So I went in the middle of the avenue. And I raised my right arm, I cannot do it anymore, as high as I could. And I made the V sign, the victory sign of Winston Churchill. Because we all knew that during the war, Winston Churchill was very seldom photographed without doing the V sign, the victory sign. So I hope that the tank would, uh, would understand that I am a friend. And I waited. And because I am extremely lucky, the tank did not kill me, but stop. I asked for the officer in charge to come down. And he came down. I was quite assertive, I must say. <laughs> And he came down and I told him that I had extremely important information and to take me immediately to headquarters. And he took me. Here again, I was so lucky because it was the French army which invaded Freiburg. And I was so lucky because if an English-speaking army had invaded Freiburg. I don't know how I could have communicated with them 
because I didn't speak English yet. But with the French army, there was no problem. So that officer took me to the headquarters where I met Colonel uh, Commander Petit of the Second Zouave, another regiment of North Africa. And Commander Petit immediately told me, who tells me that the truth? It may be a trap. So I just wrote for him a phone number because we had the same technology as the American Army. You could call any service in the field. Commander Petit called my service, who reassured him that he could trust me, and they were happy to know that I was still alive because I had no radio, remember? So I couldn't communicate often. And Commander Petit sent the patrol to the Siegfried Line, which came back hours later and said that's true. The Siegfried Line is completely evacuated. So I was a very important VIP that night at the French headquarters in Freiburg. I was invited for dinner. I was given a room. And the next morning at breakfast, Commander Petit asked me if I wanted to go back to my service, intelligence service. I told him, no, my mission terminates the day of the armistice. This morning, I have to cross the front south of Freiburg. But I asked him for huge, huge service. I asked him for a bicycle because I was tired of walking. <laughs> so with that bicycle, I was riding down a huge summit south of Freiburg after crossing the front with a problem. And I saw stopped along the road a group of German military ambulances. And the colonel was a physician, I could tell by his uniform. And all his entourage were standing around the ambulances. So I stopped. When you are in intelligence, you see something unusual, you stop to inquire what's going on. And I, I found out, the colonel told me that that night they are going to drive to ride into Switzerland, which was not far, and from there to Austria to prevent to become prisoners of war. And then they asked me from where I was coming. And I told them that I had just escaped from Freiburg that morning. That was a few hours later. And that I was terrified in Freiburg by the French army, which had Moroccan, Algerian, Tunisian, and black soldiers, which was the truth. Our army had these, these men in our army because we still had colonies in North Africa and Africa at that time. But if you remember, how racist the Germans were. You can realize the effect of what I was telling them, made on them. I was now for them a model of a German patriot. And I too complain that our German army was not defending us anymore as much as they should. After a while, the colonel said to me, don't be so afraid. The war is not terminated. And he told me exactly where the remnant of the German <coughs> army was hidden in ambush, in the black forest waiting for the Allied armies. And that information I was able to get in to Switzerland because before I left, uh, 
Colonel Reinhardt had told me, if ever you are in trouble, go into Switzerland, find the custom men, they are all over, and tell him you are a Swiss agent, not a French agent. And that's what I did. I had my letter just written in French. I did not take time to write it in codes because that takes a very long time. But that major, major information had to get in the hands of my service as fast as I could. So at daybreak, I, had, I crossed into Switzerland. And I had adventures, but you have to read that in my book. I have no time to go into that. But I finally found the Swiss customer, gave him my letter, and he transferred it to Colonel Reinhardt in, a, in a Basel, which was a big distance from where I met the, the customer. And Colonel Reinhardt read it because he wanted to know what it was. It was in French, not coded, and then transferred it to my service. And that's why I got all these medals on the table. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mart. Thank you so much. We will now have some questions and answers. I ask that if you have a question, please come up to the microphone to, on the right of the room. And if anyone is in the overflow uh, area and you'd like to ask a question, please come to the auditorium and line up at this microphone over here, right in front of me, and we'll do some questions and answers. There are a few books still left available on your way out. Any questions? I love questions. <laughs> also, also, I just want to mention that if you are in the overflow area, thank you so much for your patience as we were perfecting the audio. Um, and definitely please come to the auditorium so that you're able to meet Mart in person. Okay. Question. Oh, the microphone thing. Uh, Hi, I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you very, very much. That was that was amazing. Just absolutely amazing. Um, maybe I misunderstood, but when you were going to nursing school in Marseille, they knew that you were Jewish, or they did not know you were Jewish. When you went to nursing school in Marseille, they knew you were Jewish? Sure they knew, because that's why they didn't want me. <laughs> <laughs> but they allowed you to get they your... They were obliged to take me, if not Mrs. Keller was going to fire them. Uh, so that's why they took me. Uh -huh. And they made your life miserable. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome. Other question? How many languages do you speak? How many languages do you speak? I speak French and English now. My German is quite trusted because I, since I am in the United States, I never speak it. But I can still read it. Please don't be shy. Step up to the microphone. Hi. What happened to the vouchers? How did you handle that? How did you handle the vouchers? Oh, that's a good question. 
in Singen, the first city where I stopped, I lived with a woman for two days and I helped her. We had trouble in the first morning because when I got up the first morning, she was very hospitable when I arrived. But the next morning when I saw her in the kitchen, where she was already when I came in, I saw immediately that she was in a very bad mood. And she told me I could not sleep all night because I noticed that your stockings were completely torn. And I wondered if you had called in from Switzerland <laughs> because we are constantly warned that we are so close. It was only two kilometers from where I crossed to the city of Singen. So we are constantly warned that that uh, spies are crawling in from Switzerland. And then she looked at me straight in the eyes and she said, Fräulein, which means young lady, are you a spy? And I started laughing. I was standing and I bent off a little bit with my arms outstretched and said, do I look like a spy? And she started laughing too. And we became very good friends. And I helped her with a little boy. So when I left, she came with me to the train station. And when I took my voucher out, not knowing how to do it, she took it from my hand and she filled it up. And that's how I learned how to do it. And she saved my life without knowing it. That's a great story, thanks. Thank you. Hi there. Um, how did you or did you still practice your religion? Did you hide it? Did you still pray? How did you practice when you were supposed to be hiding who you how were? How did you hide your religion during that time? You know, you, my religion had not to be hidden. I just didn't talk about it. I had no time even. Right, did, you, did you still pray on your own? Did you honor did the you holy days somehow in, inside? Did you pray on your own? Do you know, I always prayed in French, not in Hebrew, because I didn't understand Hebrew. I could only read it. So I never prayed in Hebrew. I prayed in French. You prayed in French. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, Hi. First of all, I just want to say um, thank you very much. I, I have no words to express my appreciation for people like you and what you, what humanity owes people like you. Um, my question is kind of a broad philosophical one. In the moment that you were going through the trials that you obviously did, did you feel the enormity of what you were doing? Because it must have seemed so helpless. Did you feel the enormity of the moment you were in? Did you feel the enormity of what you were going to do when you were lying? Yeah, well, that's why I couldn't move. I was so terrified because suddenly I realized the immensity of what I was going to undertake. And I realized the holes in my alibi. Yeah. And that frightened me so terribly. So. That's why I just suddenly realized before that I was so busy that I had never time to think what I will do in Germany. They kept me very busy. <laughs> I am very impressed. So I'm going to thank you in the three languages I understand. Thank you, Willen Dank, Maxi. Thank you. <laughs> so Hi. Um, so my grandpa was in the Air Force in the 100th Bomb Group over France. And I was wondering if you ever spoke with the French underground, like in communication. And I was wondering, you probably talked to the same people he talked to, but. My grandfather was in the Air Force over France. Did you ever meet any of the people shot down? 
Yeah, I met them when they were trying to hide in, in occupied France. I met several, but we talked, but we had not much time because it was extremely dangerous. They had to leave as fast as possible. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Miriam, and we have, we had a friend of blessed memory, Knut Dyby, and I wonder if you ever met him. He was righteous among the Gentiles, and his story, he wrote up in boats in the night. He was in Denmark, and he was taking the Jews in fishing boats over to the neutral country, and when he would come back, when he got to the neutral country, he'd have to buy fish to put in the boat so that he wouldn't be suspected of smuggling Jews out of Denmark. If you had any contact with, the, with Knut Dybe. With the fishermen in Denmark. No, I, no, I but, had absolutely no contact. It was impossible to travel across from France to Denmark. It was not possible. It's still not that easy, I understand. And I went to Denmark now, but ah, not then. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you very much for mentioning uh, the, uh, the uh, people who helped the Danish Jews. Thank you. No, but I read a book about that story. I read was it Boats in the Night? by a young girl oh, by, about oh. that story in Denmark. Ah, uh, that was Anne Frank. And it, it, no, it was written in Denmark, but it was translated in French. Oh, okay. I, you know, I'm going to try to get you the book, Boats in the Night. You will enjoy okay. it, I think. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to take a quick photo off before the photographer has to head out. <laughs> Give us your story. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, okay, so... Go on. Two things. One, were, was there ever any instance where there was like a Nazi or someone questioning you and it your life could be put on the line? Like, was there any moments where it was like you were being threatened by Nazis and like... Uh, were you, you had ever to, in danger? What? Were you ever in danger yeah. while you were in Germany? That's what she's asking. Were you ever in danger? Yeah, I was very often in danger. And I told you one story about that woman asking me if I was a spy. That was one. If I had not answered immediately and in the right way, I would have been arrested and I would have been killed. Also, how did you end up in America? How did you end up in America? Oh, I came because my husband imported me. He's an American. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Did you able to yes, take some Thank you so much. You're welcome. Into the canal. Um, how did you survive that night after you got out of the canal? How did you stay warm enough to survive that evening? When I fell in the canal. How did you survive when you got out? Oh, how did you stay I warm? I walked all night and I didn't even catch a cold. <laughs> <laughs> but if you read my book, you will see that after that I found a French colon of. Moroccan soldiers who thought that there was a German spy because I was all wet and I was in, in an area where I was not supposed to be. And, but that continued. So the so officer who commanded him, the French officer who commanded them, told them to find a German prisoner of war, they had prisoners of war with them in the column to take the uniform of the smallest prisoner and give it to me. <laughs> so now I was dressed 
in a German uniform, much too big for me. <laughs> thank you. Hi, I just want to thank you for coming to our small town and sharing your wonderful story. Um, I wanted to know if you would share how long you two have been married. <laughs> how long have we been married? I was 61 years, the 9th of February, it will be 62. Mazel tov. Thank you. Bonsoir, Madame Kohn. Uh, merci pour nous remercier. I, I wanted to ask you um, just your uh, kind of, I guess, knowledge of the Camp Mille. So due to your proximity to um, Aix-en-Provence and Marseille, did you ever encounter any French or German in intellects that were in, um, in these, uh, that were imprisoned in this uh, Camp de Mille, if you're familiar with that camp in, I think, in southern France? It's in between Aix-en-Provence and Marseille, and uh, so I visited the uh, Camp de Mille uh, last year, and uh, we heard many stories that many German intellects who uh, did not want to participate in the, uh, uh, did not in the whole Nazi and, and, and German regime, they were either received by the Consulate of Mexico, or they were in these, um, it was, they were in Camp de Mille. So I was just familiar if you were by any chance, like any ever encountered any of these like intellects or just like uh, people who were uh, in prison in, in these um, camps in France? And and come to meet the uh, come to meet, which is right between uh, Marseille and Aix en Provence. Why were they in prison? Uh, no, no. The, these were German intellects who were, or German people who did not uh, who didn't want to participate and... Did you ever meet German people in the southern part of France who didn't want to participate in the German army? No, I never met them, but I know that a lot of Germans did not want to go on the Russian front and were shot by their own army because they refused to go on the Russian front. Mm. They were shot in France, in certain parts of France, because they refused to go on the Russian, to the Russian front. Okay. But Thank I you. never met them. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that you didn't think that your story was someone would be something that people would want to listen to. And um, I'm wondering what changed your mind to want to tell people about your story? I didn't grasp the... Sorry, um, I'll rephrase. Over here. Um, at the beginning she said that she didn't want, she didn't think that her story was worth telling. So what changed her mind? Oh, you didn't think his story was worth telling. What changed your mind? What oh. changed your mind and made you tell? Oh, I got it. There are many reasons, you know, human acts are never because of one reason, there are always many reasons. One of the reasons was that until the 1990s, the late 1990s, nobody in Europe or America was interested in what was going on during the war. Mm -hmm. They all want to talk about the future, not the past. Mm -hmm. In the 90, late 1990s, suddenly, <coughs> the interest in the World War II started. And that's when I felt that I should give my, that I should talk about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So in 1996, the Spielberg Group, the Spielberg Foundation, yes. had an advertisement in the LA Times demanding that all the people who had fought against the Germans should come forward. And I felt that was the right thing. Mm. So I, I gave my testimony to them. And then the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., 
had the same advertisement in the LA Times. I called them and told them that I had already given my testimony to the Spielberg Group, but they still came from Washington to my home and interviewed me, and many others after that. Mm -hmm. So, and another reason was, until the late 1990s, I had absolutely no document showing that I was even in the army. Because if you are in intelligence, you have no documents. Yeah. But I went, like my DVD say, I went to PAU, P -A -U, a city where the army, French army archives are kept. And they gave me all my documents. Now I prove that I was in the army and I had done certain things. But how can you talk about it when you have absolutely no documents? It makes sense. <laughs> the proof is that my best neighbors <laughs> and the daughter is here. One day they were outside in front of the house, just across from ours, and I went over and talked to them. And they were talking about, there was a group, and they were talking about intelligence. And I said, I was too in intelligence. And they looked at me and said, sure. <laughs> so I stopped talking about the thing <laughs> Thank you very much. And they don't is here to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. I was wondering. Did you ever make any genuine friendships or positive relationships with people behind the enemy lines? Do you ever form any relationship with the people you met while you were doing that? No. When you are in intelligence, when you leave, you have left. And you never return. That's one of the rules, absolute rules for your safety and the safety of your family. So you never felt drawn, so it was completely... absolutely never have any relationship with anybody, even the ones who were in the French army. Oh. You don't, you don't, you cut all relationship. Thank you. You welcome. Um, do you think that something like the Holocaust could ever happen again? Do you think that a Holocaust can ever happen again? You are very brave to ask that question. And you are very brave to talk on the, phone, on the microphone. That's very good. And I will answer you. There are already genocides, which is the same thing as the Holocaust. That means that people are killed for no reason. A whole group of people. And that happens all over the world already. So, the uh, Holocaust of Jews can happen anytime. And right now, it's a very dangerous time for that. Okay. Uh, we have to fight it. We cannot let it happen. Okay? Okay. That's marvelous. Thank you. Yeah. Thank everyone. Terminate. What? Thank. Thank you very much. You were a very good audience. And very great to see so much. If there's anyone here by the name Justine Zeng, I have something for you. So find me. Thank you.